And finally, the third jihad. So there's jihad fighting physically. And the jihad against the naf, nafs or the soul. And then Imam Razi says the jihad with the non-antagonistic, non-Muslims. So every non-Muslim is not our enemy. This is a, an idea that's gaining in popularity nowadays uh, because of the desperate situation of many people in, uh, peoples in the Muslim world. But it is not an essential belief in Islam. It's an erroneous belief. Allah, and a lot of it is influenced by our being influenced by non-Islamic systems of thought. You can analyze a lot of our Islamic movements. They're, they're, they're Marxist-Leninist movements with Islamic clothing on. So you use Islamic terminologies and categorizations, but the way they're structured. And, and a proof of that is that how do they look at Muslims who have the same Aqidah, the same Madhab, who oppose their ideas? Their Muslim brothers and sisters become their political enemies. This is a characteristic of Marxists. And there are, there are dynamics that you can study to document how this happened. You have, you have Islamic organization that are broken down into cellular structures that are exact replicas of Maoist groups. And this is a fact. And their tactics are the same. Their tactics in student organizing, uh, how we're going to take over the MSA, it's just like the Marxist thing. How are we going to take over the MSA and get rid of these reactionaries? The five-minute warning, which she's been holding up for 10 minutes. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum, brother. OK, sister, we're, we're riding, the, we're winding down, inshallah. So anyway, all non-Muslims are not our enemies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين. Allah does not forbid you from behaving justly and having good amicable relations with those non-Muslims who have not fought you and who have not driven you from your homes. Verily, Allah loves those who are just. So. This is how we, we have to understand our neighbors and understand the people we share this land with. And I say this very pur purpose, uh, purposefully. Allah, the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه Then no one of you believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And many of the commentators on this hadith, they say he loves for his brother in humanity. أَخِيهِ فِي الْإِنْسَانِيَةِ Allah Ta'ala says in the Qur'an, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ That we've ennobled the son of Adam, the human being in general. Every human being has a, a potential in him or potential in her for good. Because this is part of the ennoblement that Allah Ta'ala has bestowed upon the human being. So it's our job to bring that good out of people. And this was the way of the Prophet. The Prophet, he didn't hate people bitterly. And he told you should not hate people too extreme. Otherwise, there's a, a day will come when that hatred will prevent you from reconciling with that person. And you shouldn't love people too extreme. You should love Allah to, to an extreme. Because if you do, there will, become a, there will come a day when it will be impossible for you to be separated from that person. And everyone, no matter how much we love them, we have to leave them. And it might ultimately be at the time of our death. So we're leaving. The one that loves us, we're leaving. And the Prophet was like this. And because of this, he could, after the worst year, the worst year in the Dawn was the year of Uhud. After the Battle of Uhud, where the Prophet is almost killed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's bloody, his tooth is knocked out, he's, he's bleeding. Many of the eminent Sahaba, such as Hamza, 
and Mus'ab bin Umayr and others are killed at that battle. And, and, and it all occurred after the Muslims on the verge of victory, which made it even more crushing. If it happened from the outset, it's one thing, but right, the victory is right there, and then you have this tremendous setback. And then after that, during that same year, what happened? The uh, Bi'ul Ma'una, where 70 of his companions were slaughtered when they were sent on an expedition to the Najd to give da'wah to people. And then Yawmul Raji'ah, where another expedition was slaughtered and massacred. So it was a very difficult year. But during that same year, and this is oft times overlooked, the Meccans were experiencing a famine. And the Prophet وسلم, sent a caravan of food to them. Sallallahu So you can't do this if you hate a people to extreme. And the conquest of Mecca, these people fought against him. They tried to kill him. They tried to destroy his mission. But when he, when he came and entered the city as a victor, what did he do? Wipe them all out? This is what would probably happen nowadays. He said, There's no blame on you today. You're free. Go. And most of them came into Islam. So this isn't a person uh, that is deluded by some idea of a perpetual revolution against an irretractable enemy. This is the best of humanity who's sent to call humanity to the best of ways. And that's our job here. That is our job here in this country. So this, but this is a jihad, this is a struggle. It's a struggle that requires that we try to understand what makes people tick here. We have to have research institutions. And these are set up only as a result of struggle. But we can do this. We have to have charitable organizations. Last night we saw the work of Iman. We have to have organizations that are going into the inner cities, going into areas that no one else is going, and trying to arrest this, this, this ravaging of human beings that's going on in this country, where the prisons keep filling up. Even the person who, who designed this whole uh, policy of imprisonment, I forget his name, after he saw the prisons have now reached two million, he said two million is too much. Two million is too much. In the state of California, since 1980, they've built 25 new prisons and one new university. And every prison, you can build a university with that money. So we have to, and so if the government doesn't do it, we as Muslims have to start doing it. There's nothing to stop us. And this is dawah. Dawah is many times what you do and not what you say. So there's a lot for us to do out of love, out of love for people. We have to love people. <laughs> These are our brothers and sisters in humanity. So, and, and we have to understand this and we have to reach out to our spouses and children. It's a struggle relating to them. Allah Ta'ala says that some of them are enemies. And you're, so your enemy, you have to fight against, but not physically fight against. Fight against with patience, forbearance. Ya yuhalladhina amanu inna min azwajikum wa awladikum aduwa lakum fahdharuhum wa intafu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru fa inna dhali fa inna allaha ghafur rahim. O ye who believe verily amongst your spouses and amongst your children are enemies unto you. But if you overlook their faults and forbear with them and forgive them, verily Allah is the most forgiving and merciful. This is a struggle and we have to fight it. We have to fight it. Brothers and sisters, you have to fight to keep your marriages together if you're married. It's a fight. A lot of people are falling to the wayside because they don't realize it's a fight. So they get waylaid. If you're in a, a boxing ring in Madison Square Garden and there are bright lights everywhere and 20,000 people smoking cigars, 
you better start ducking because you're in a ring. And if you don't believe you're in a ring, you're going to get hurt. So they, as, as Muhammad Ali said once, I won't even say it, uh, he taught us the launching of a satellite, you get launched. I said, what was that? <laughs> I don't know, but here it comes again. <laughs> so once you get into the ring of marriage, understand you're in a, a battle. So you have to fight to keep your marriage together. Shaitan is trying to waylay you. He's trying to do you in. And Allah Ta'ala says it. Allah Ta'ala says it. فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ That these Satans, they learn from these two angels, Harut wa Marut, that which divides between the man and his wife. So Shaitan is your enemy. فَاتَّخِذُوهُ adua. Take him as an enemy. So this is a struggle, and I don't want to belabor the point because I got the five-minute warning 15 minutes ago. So we have to fight against shaitan and his dupes. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, as we said, all nine Muslims are not our enemies. They are not our enemies. And they are not, by and large, antagonistic to us in this country. There are well-publicized abuses. The case of Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, the case of Imam Jamil, the case of this poor uh, brother Ahmed Chaudhry in California, and, and others. There's, but these are not the rule. These are the exception. These are not the rule. These are the exception. And until they become the rule, we have to reach out. And we have to understand our shari status in this land. We exist here, and I, I've said this, and you've heard others say this, and you've heard people reject it. But I'll say it again. We exist in a covenant of protection. It's called aman, mustatman, in this country. And as such, we cannot fight against these people. And we cannot try to undermine these people. But we're free to call them to Islam. Imam al-Shafi says in Kitab al-Um. And there's other, other thick rulings in terms of when you can justify the exist in a non-Muslim land. Imam al-Shafi says in Kitab al-Um, he says, if a group of Muslims enters a non-Muslim land and are guaranteed protection, their enemies are safe from them until they leave their lands. They have no right to oppress or betray them. The Muslims have no right to oppress or betray them. This is the Sharia. Even if, if a, 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 a person were part of a country that's in a state of war against a certain population, they could cease that war as Muslims if the, their antagonists ask for peace. Allah Ta'ala says, if they're inclined towards peace, then you incline towards peace, then trust in Allah. Or if the Imam says there's a chance of mass conversion amongst those people. And there's a chance here. And this is a whole nother talk. So I don't want to even get into it because the sister started throwing the notebook at me. So I'm going to stop here. وجزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So I guess uh, it's time for the question and answer session. So الحمد لله والشكر لله لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر. We'll conclude the speech with about a 15 to 20 minute question answer session. Um, all you're going to really have to do is raise your hand and I'll point to you. Um, if you could just keep the questions um, brief and, and if you could project so everyone in the auditorium could hear you. Um, yeah.